who join us tonight as we continue looking at the um, Hebrew alphabet. We I want to especially welcome Paul, our presenter. And I trust that tonight will be another fulfilling night. Um, and so with no further delay, let me just welcome Paul as he presents. Paul, are you there? Yes. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. Good. Let me just share my screen. Okay, let's pull this up. Okay. Let us begin. All right. Shalom, everyone. It's um, been an interesting journey thus far. We are just going to do a brief recap of last lesson's oat or symbol, which of course is the, the chet. Of course, the chet, if you recall, was the image of a wall or a fence. It is the eighth Hebrew symbol, and of course represents a wall and a fence, right? Which of course means to divide, sever something apart to make it separate or holy. And thus, if something is holy, it is something that is new. So when the scriptures talk about all things new, right, that means you, you are set apart. You have been divided from the old life and entered into the new life. Just give me a second. Let me see if I can find my phone and lock off that notification. All right. Okay. So now we are. Let's open this up, all right? We are now at the Tate, right? And that actually is the Hebrew word Tate. I don't know what happened to my Paleo Hebrew. <laughs> it got lost somewhere, but it will find it back again. So if we look to the extreme left, that is the original Tate. It looks like a circle with an X in the middle. I will explain that later. And of course, it doesn't change in Middle, middle Hebrew or Paleo Hebrew. And then it became this shape in the Babylonian time. And that is the shape that you're going to encounter in modern Hebrew script. Okay, that's the modern Tate. In fact, I, I think that the shape of the modern Tate actually might be related to the old one, which of course is the first one, which is this, right? That is the Tate. So <clears throat> Tate, the word Tate is actually from the Hebrew word Tit. If you notice, this is how Tate is spelt, and this is Tit. So you can see the resemblance there in the word. Of course, Tit in Hebrew means to be sticky, like mud or clay. So this is the actual word for Tit in Hebrew. And you can see, apparently to be sticky, and you notice that it says here <clears throat> that it actually might be related to a demon, right? As though the idea of dirt being swept away, figuratively. Uh, so of course you have mud or clay, which is what we're focusing on. I have the wrong thing highlighted. Figuratively, it might actually mean calamity. So let's see what that actually has to relate to Tate. <laughs> so Tate comes from that word Tate, which of course is mud or clay. The representation of the Hebrew Tate is 
mud, clay as it surrounds a vessel, right? So the idea of the Tate is that it is a vessel, right? Made of mud or clay, and therefore has this idea of surrounding and containing something, right? Now, in the middle of that symbol for the Tate is a ta, right? Ta in Hebrew is a mark, right? It means covenant. And of course, if you look, this is the symbol that we're very familiar with, which we would call the cross, is actually ta, right? Which is the mark, right? This is the Paleo Hebrew, which is not that too far from this. But I, I put the Paleo Hebrew here so that, you know, my next slide would look, um, we would make a better connection with my next slide. So the Tate, remember, was a circle, right? This is a Tate. It's a circle. So this is, you're looking at the vessel from above, right? And then there is a ta in the middle, right? That's a ta, right? So the Paleo uh, Hebrew ta would be kind of slant, while the Semitic Hebrew would be more upright, giving us that familiar shape that we're used to, right? So ta means covenant, right? And earthen vessels were actually used to store items uh, that were symbolic of covenants, right? This included things like bread, right? We, of course, are very familiar with the fact that bread is symbolic of covenant. Wine is symbolic of covenant, oil, grain. And of course, these are titles were actually put in earthen vessels. And of course, the Torah, <laughs> which of course is a deed or it is a title, and also something symbolic of covenant was also stored in earthen vessels. Thus, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? So here is a excerpt taken from Jeremiah, right, or Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, Yahweh's word came to me saying, behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle will come to you saying, buy my field that is in Anathah, for the right of redemption is yours to buy it. So Hanamel, my uncle's son, came to me in the court of the guard, according to Yahweh's word, and said to me, please buy my field that is in Anathoth, which is in the land of Benjamin, for the right of the inheritance is yours, and the redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was Yahweh's word. I bought the field that was in Anathoth of Hanmel, my uncle's son, and weighed him the money, even 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, call witnesses and weigh the money in the balance to him. To him, sorry. <laughs> so I took the deed of the purchase, both that was sealed containing the terms and conditions and that which was open. Uh, I just want to just want you to understand that when we go to Revelation, we notice that there's a scroll with seven seals, right? That's because any, any covenant has different parts. It has different portions and each, each one of those portions are, are sealed, right? So it says, I delivered a deed to, um, of the purchase to Baruch, the son of Nirnia, the son of Mah Maseah, right? In the presence of Hanmel, my uncle's son, and in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of the purchase before all the Yehudim, the Jews, who sat in the court of the guard. I commanded Baruch before them saying, Yahweh of armies, the Elohim of Israel says, take these deeds, this deed of, of the purchase, which is sealed, and this deed, which is open and put them in an earthen vessel that they may last many days. So again, so we have scriptural evidence that, you know, something symbolic of the covenant, right? Thus the talk is stored in an earthen vessel. Thus we have that symbol of a circle with a tar in the middle, right? That's why the Tate looks that way, right? All right, so the word Tate again comes from this word teat, right? Which means mud or clay, right? So if you were to look at the individual, you know, uh, symbols of the word teat, you'd get, you know, um, the Tate, actually means a container um, with a clay or mud, which means to kind of surround. Uh, the yod, of course, is a hand that means work, right? It means to 
you know, to complete our work or to do our work, right? That's what the, the, the hand means, right? So by my hand, right? So, and again, we have another um, Tate. So of course, if you put those three things together, they get clay working on clay, right? Which is what clay is. Clay literally is clay, you know, um, working with clay or binding to clay, right? So mud or clay is unable to be transformed unless through water. You can't make clay from clay, right? Think of it like this um, clay dirt cannot be used to mold or shape anything unless you add water to that clay dirt or just dirt, right? So it says the clay or soil particles cannot bind with each other unless through water. So water is actually what makes, you know, these things come together into covenant. And that's kind of the idea of, of what mud or clay is. It's dependent on water. Now, this is very significant because who is made from clay? Who is made from dirt? We are, right? So we, we have here from Breshit chapter two, six to seven, it says, but, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground, right? People miss this part in the creation. The whole entire earth was watered, right? And thus prepared. And Yahweh Elohim formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and became a living soul. So when we read in Yochanan that, you know, uh, in the beginning was the word and all things are made through him. Remember, the word is also connected to water. So therefore, all things are made through water. And we can confirm this in Breshit or Genesis chapter 1 and verse, um, verse 20. Every single thing is made through the word, is made through water, right? So even we see here uh, man, right? The earth was first watered and then he formed man out of the ground, right? So... We're going to do some recaps here. As we learned in the previous lessons, right? Uh, the Gemel, right, uh, has a value of three. That's the third symbol, right? And of course, connected to the Ruach HaKadosh. So if we look at the first three, you know, they're connected to, you know, the Father, the Son, the Ruach, right? So we know three is connected to the Ruach HaKadosh, right? And we have here, Yahweh imparting his breath, the rock Elohim, also known as the Nishma Chaim, or the breath of life into man, is, is kind of symbolic of, uh, well, so, well, we're gonna see, it's, it's, we're, we're looking at the, the whole idea that man is, man is the clay, right? And it's not, it's not enough for you to add water, but he also needs to be formed. He also needs to be shaped and then he needs to be completed. And that's that's the whole, uh, when I say completed, he needs to be filled. So we see that, we see man, Adam is shaped, right? He's formed and he's filled, right? And that is really the same kind of process that we have to go through. We have to be, we have to be taken out. We have to be shaped, you know, we have to be formed. We have to also be filled, right? So, of course, uh, we know that Adam, or man, right, is represented by the wall, right, which have a value of six. And when we see um, the implementation of the fact that the, um, the rock is breathed into man, representing six, rock is three, man is six, we get, of course, the Tate. Right, so again, remember I said that the clay, the mud, right, is made from water. And thus we move from six to nine, which is the tate, which represents literally a vessel of honor. So the tate in Hebrew, it represents a vessel. But remember, you know, as I said to you, initially the tate is a vessel, but what's inside of the vessel? is something relating to the covenant, right? And so once it is that you hold the covenant with inside of you, you are a vessel of honor. So you see what makes your vessel of honor or dishonor is based off of what is inside of you, right? So for man, which is wow, number six, 
to become a vessel of honor, number nine, he must have within him the rock, right? Which is the seal, which is the mark of those who are true believers or true, true parts of Israel, right? So just a little recap, the rock, Gemel three plus man, wow, six gives the clay vessel of honor, which is nine or the Tate, right? That's simple, simple mathematics, right? All right, now, here's a very interesting thing. There are many prophecies in the scriptures concerning, you know, the Tate, concerning, you know, uh, this whole idea of the vessel of honor thing. So the first one is taken from Yochanan 2. This, of course, is a famous, you know, uh, wedding feast. This is where he does his first miracle, right? So it says the third day, keeping, you know, since I have a little asterisk there, anything that you say, I have a little asterisk, you know, keep a little note there. So the third day, right? Interesting where we were talking about the Ruach and the number three. And here we have the third day. There was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and Yeshua's mother was there. Yeshua also was invited, but uh, uh, with his disciples, right, to the wedding. Then the wine ran out, and Yeshua's mother said to him, they have no wine. And Yeshua said to her, woman, what does this have to do? What, what, what does that have to do with you and me? What does it have to do? And, <laughs> you know... <laughs> I, I want you to appreciate that his mother was well submitted to him um, because I can can imagine that going not going well with my mother. But uh, it says here, my hour has not yet come. That's a very significant line right there. I want you to pay attention to that. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, whatever he says to you, do it. All right? Wise woman. It says, now there were six water pots of stone. Again, you see my little asterisk, right? Set there after the Jews' way of purifying, containing two or three. That's, that's his measures, measures a piece, right? Yeshua said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said, now draw some out and take it to the ruler of the feast. So they took it. And when the ruler of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and didn't know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The ruler of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves a good wine first. And when the guests have drunk freely, then that which is worse, you have kept the good wine until now. So, of course. Uh, this is a very significant piece of scripture, but there are so many things going on in there. But you would have noticed several things uh, that we spoke about. You would have noticed the number three showing up, and you would have noticed the whole thing about the stone uh, vessel. So here's my little recap on that. One, notice that this takes place on the third day. That should, you know, you should be thinking when you hear th three, anytime you hear three. Notice that there are there are six earthen stone vessels, six representing what? Man. Man made it made of what? Earth, right? By the way, notice I have stone there. Um, shalom. Okay, that was an accident. Okay. Now, number three says these vessels were set apart, they were holy. Remember, the scripture says that these vessels were set apart for purification. So these are holy vessels. So these, these six earthen stone vessels that represent men, they are holy. They are set apart, right? Now, notice that they contained a measure of water, right? And by the way, I have living water there because they would have been drying living water, right? Water that is fresh. So... If you're going to purify, you are required to use living water, water that came out of a spring, something from it, something that was fresh water, right? Living water that had life in there, right? River. Now, notice that it had water in there, but then water was added to it, right? And then upon being filled, it became new wine. So it had three contents. Again, Number three, 
Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKadosh. Now, notice my sixth, my sixth part point right there um, is that we see the six vessels, which represents man, right? Is actually, there are three things, well, three things as one added to that vessel, the Ruach HaKadosh, right? And that's why we get a vessel of honor, right? Because uh, what, was, what was actually highly praised in this account of, you know, the wedding feast, this wine that was brought out in the last, right? Similarly, we all start off very, you know, horrible, just like the, you know, the horrible wine that is given out first, but then we are made new wine in the end and something of praise and honor, right? That brings praise and honor to who? The bridegroom, right? So we, we will become praise and honor to the bridegroom if we are filled with the Ruach HaKadosh and that we work by that, by that Ruach, right? By that spirit. So of course, look at this. Notice that, again, this happens on the third day. Look at what Hoshia says. Hoshia chapter six, one to two says, come, let's return to Yahweh for he has torn us to pieces and he will heal us. He has injured us and he will bind up our wounds. It says after two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up and we will live before him. So I want you to see that these vessels, these six earthen vessels, they're brought to life on the third day. That's not a chance. And you remember, you know, it says after two days, he will revive us on the third. Sorry, after two days, um, he will revive us on the third day. He will raise us up, right? Let's go back a little bit. Notice how much water was in the vessel. It was containing, oh, it was containing two to three measures. Two to three measures. You think that's an accident that it contained two to three measures? right not at all because that's exactly what it was it was given like when people who are yahudi when they're, they're hebrews when they read the brihadasha they can't help but see you know these connections they're they're obvious they're obvious connections right these these vessels they were made alive on the wedding feast just like how we will be brought to life on the wedding feast right so so Again, now um, let me let me move forward. So let's move forward here. So on the third day, these earthen stone vessels were filled with what new wine, right? And we know that new wine is actually connected to blood. If you don't know that, I will explain that a little bit further, right? So these earthen vessels were filled with new wine and became what? living stones that should that should ring some bells right yeah so if if you have a stone that has life in there it's, it's a living stone and that's that's what represents that's that's us we are living stones if we have the rock within us right so let's look at a prophecy that you know is similar through moshe all this is connected to tate and when we talk about tate we remember we, we're talking about a vessel of honor right? It's a vessel, a mud clay, an earthen vessel uh, to honor, right? Something that holds the ta, holds the covenant, right? Particularly the covenant of Yahweh, right? Yahweh Elohim. So this is actually taken, ooh, I didn't have the reference here. This is taken from uh, Shemot chapter four, I believe. So this is Moshe's first plague, right? So Yahweh said to Moshe, Pharaoh's heart is stubborn, right? He refuses to let the people go. Let's see if I can, I if I can move this. Can I move this? Oh, yes, let me move this away. I apologize, right? <clears throat> Pharaoh's heart is stubborn. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning. Behold, he is going out to the water. You shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. You shall take the rod, which was turned to a serpent in your hand, you shall tell him, Yahweh the Elohim of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. Behold, until now you haven't listened. Yahweh says, in this you shall know that I am Yahweh. 
Behold, I will strike with the rod that is in my hand on the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. The fish that are in the river will die, and the river will become foul, right? The Egyptians will loathe to drink the water from the river. And Yahweh said to Moshe, tell Aharon, take your rod and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, over their streams, and over their pools, and over their ponds of water, that they may become blood. Now, what many people will know is that word there for pond is the word mikvah, right? Which is what we, um, it's actually the word to immerse, right? So it means a, uh, a collection of water. So anywhere there's a collection of water, there would be blood. And you're going to see why, I mean, you're going to see this explained um, in the latter verse. It says, there will be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in what? Vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. So here we have again Moshe, and he does this miracle that causes these stone vessels to be filled with blood, right? Now, um, we look in the scriptures, I'll tell you that um, the, the scriptures also tell us that trees are like unto men, just like how we see stones are connected or earth is connected to men, right? So here we have that interesting connection of Moshe doing a miracle that is actually that Yeshua did a miracle just like Moshe, right? By transforming water into blood. And you're gonna see that blood and wine are synonymous. So we see from the Torah that blood and wine are the same. And thus the words of Yeshua in that the wine represented his blood in the renewed covenant blessing restored from Melchizedek that we know him as Mel Melchizedek, right? So Melchizedek, um, it literally, it means, you know, a king of righteousness, right? And of course, I'm referring to what is in Breshit or Genesis 14, 18, where he came with the bread and the wine, right? So it says, we also see that blood is what represents the Ruach HaKadosh, and thus why we receive the blood or the Ruach of Yeshua, Yahweh, as a deposit or a transfusion of the renewed covenant, right? So here is Yeshua, Isaiah 49, 26. It says, I will feed those who oppress you with their own flesh, and they will be drunk on their own blood as what? With sweet wine. So you notice there's a connection between blood and wine, right? This is in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament writings, the so-called Old Testament writings, right? Then all flesh shall know that I, Yahweh, am your savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Yaakov, right? So this is taken from 1st Yochanan, chapter 5. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Ruach HaKodesh. And these three are Echad, they're one, right? And there are three that bear witness on the earth, the Ruach, you know, in connection to the Father. Remember, the scripture says that, you know, the Father is, is Ruach, the Father is Spirit, right? The water connected to the Word, because we know the Word is connected to water, right? And, of course, the blood, because the Ruach of Kadesh, or the Holy Spirit, is connected to blood, right? So we know that wine and blood are connected, and that blood and, and the Ruach, the Spirit, is connected. We know wine and the Spirit is connected, right? They are all connected right? It says, and these agree as Echad, they're one, right? So, all right, so we're going to look more, we're going to look at this word Tate. So before we look at the, the root word of Tate, which is Teat, right? And we said that uh, that meant mud, right? Something sticky, right? Now, the word Tate, if we were to look at the individual symbols for the word Tate, Tate, of course, means a container, clay vessel, right? To surround um, the yod is a hand that means work, something that is um, completed, finished. And the ta is the, the mark, right? That's the X, right? As you see, the two, the two sticks joining, right? That's beauty and bands, if you recall that scripture, right? He would have, been, he would have made a ta 
um, when we look in the, in the scriptures and people are marked, they would have received a ta, right? A mark, which of course is sing, um, significant of a covenant. I want you to appreciate that whenever you see tars or marks, that, that thing comes from the beginning. Anything you see uh, has a connection to the beginning. So simply an earthen vessel, the Tate is an earthen vessel containing the work of the covenant or Yahweh's mark, right? Just like the image, right? A vessel with a tar in it, right? So that should be us. That is what a Tate is, right? That's what makes you a vessel of glory that you have his mark, by the way, in that vessel. So let's look at, okay, so we have all being called and chosen. So this is something that probably uh, I wanted everybody to be reminded of. We all are called and chosen. And because we're all called and chosen, right? Those who are in his book, right? Every one of us have received a mark, right? From now, every one of us, everyone has a mark, right? Not just those in Revelation chapter seven, right? So this mark, of course, um, actually is his name and our name. And this is what, this is the scriptures that we have for this. This is second Timothy two. Yahweh knows those who are his. And it says, let everyone who names the name of Yahweh depart from unrighteousness. Now in a large house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of what? Wood and clay. That's, that's us. We are these wood or clay, wood and clay vessels, right? It says some are for what? Honor and some are for dishonor. There's a scripture that tells you that he reserves all to himself, even those for judgment. So those who are of honor and those who are dishonor, right? If anyone therefore purge himself, purges himself um, from these, of course, wickedness, right? He will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and suitable for the master's use, prepared for every good work. So everything, con everything concerning the covenant is what you'll be prepared to do if you repent and follow Torah. Now, look at this. This is Jeremiah 23, 6. In his days, Yehuda will be saved as Judah and Israel will dwell safely. This is his name by which he will be called Yahweh, our righteousness. Now I want you to look at this. It says Yehuda will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Safely. So this is Judah, Israel. Uh, oh, sorry, this is Yehuda um, and Judah, Yehuda or Judah and Israel, right? These are the two kingdoms, but they're one. You notice he refers to them as one people, one nation, right? And it says, this is his name. This is our name. Our name is Yahweh, is our righteousness. That's our name, right? Um, that's our name. So I apologize. That is the name that he's going to give us, which is his name, right? We're going to have that name upon us, Yahweh, our righteousness, right? So uh, if you're familiar with the high priest, the high priest must wear a band. He must wear a blossom. He must wear a band across his face that has what? Kadosh to Yahweh, right? Holy to Yahweh, right? That's what he has to have on his head. So we are going to be marked as us. We're going to have his name marked on us, right? Which of course is his mark, his covenant. And this is Chazal or Revelation 2.17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes to him, I will give of the hidden man. And just a quick note. When you see mana, right? That's not what is in the Hebrew. Man is the Hebrew word. What's wrong with, what's wrong with that? You will find out at another time. And I will give him a white stone. On the stone, a new name written, right? So we we there's this new name which no one knows but he who receives it so we are going to have a name and he is going to give us his name so think of it like the bride right when the bride is married right she gets a new name she gets his name right all right so now we're going to look at 
you know, where the Tate fits in at the crucifixion because it was there and all of these things were there. It's just that, you know, as we go through scriptures, you know, um, we're, we're, we miss certain things because we just don't, didn't have that knowledge, right? So I have here, Yeshua became sin. He became impure by taking on our sin, our impurity in fulfillment of our prophecy. When looking at the holiness of scripture, we know all details have a divine purpose, meaning every single thing, every single detail, divine purpose, right? So this is taken from Yochanan chapter 19, 28 and onwards to 30. It says, after this, when Yeshua knew that everything had now been finished, he said, I'm thirsty, right? So I want you to recognize, he says, I'm thirsty. Right now, when he's finished, he says, I'm thirsty, right? Now, I want you to remember what he said to his disciples, right? But um, something about drinking something. Anyways, he said that this, he said this so that scripture could finally be concluded, right? He said this so that scripture could finally be concluded. It says, a jar filled with vinegar was there. So the soldiers put a sponge soaked in the vinegar on a hyssop stick and held it to his mouth. After Yeshua had taken the vinegar, he said, it is finished. That's just interesting because let's go back. We see here, Yeshua knew everything had now been finished. Then he says, I'm thirsty. So everything is finished, yet he still had to do something to finish, right? I just want you to recognize that um, you can't think in the kind of Greek mindset, right? We, we think very concre concretely, something is finished, there's nothing more that you need to do. But that's not the situation in, in the understanding of Hebrew. In the understanding of Hebrew, when something is finished, it begins the next part of the cycle. Right, so the beginning is the end. That's why he has to say he's the beginning, the end, and the beginning. Right, because that's the whole idea of of the Hebrew mindset. There, there is a continuing into into newness. Right, that brings us into the next cycle, and then into the next cycle. Right, that's why we say we die daily. We are we're we're going from cycle to cycle, or from glory to glory. Right. So again, look at this. Um, he says. It is finished. Then he bowed his head and died, right? So I want you to look. You see that word there for vinegar, right? I have it on the line here. This word is this word, which means what? Sour wine. Vinegar is sour wine, right? So think about that. So at the end, we saw that Yeshua drank wine, right? After it was finished. Interesting, right? So. Recall this scripture that I put two asterisks there uh, before, so you're supposed to remember. Yeshua also was invited with his disciples to the wedding when the wine ran out. Yeshua's mother said to him, they have no wine. And Yeshua said to her, woman, what does that have to do with you and me? My hour has not yet come. He has nothing to do with wine until this moment. This is the hour. That has come, and now is the time for this wine to be drunk. I want you to recognize that literally when he said that, he was talking about something in the future. Isn't that interesting? I thought that was interesting, right? Let me read it again. Woman, what does that have to do? The wine has, we have no wine. What does that have to do with me? Because you know why? He asked for wine. He asked for wine at that point when everything was finished. You see, he has nothing to do with wine. You notice that when he breaks the bread and he shares the wine, he does not drink any wine. He doesn't drink any. He only drinks wine at this moment in time. It says the earthen vessel containing the vinegar, the sour wine, represents the corruption that dwelled within us that Yeshua took on to himself. This even was the cup that he was made to bear, right? Remember, Father, made this cup pass from me. When you talk, when you when you look in the scriptures and you see cup, it's 
in reference to wine, right? Whenever we talk about cup, it's usually in reference to that is the drink that you would have in a cup, wine, right? So again, interesting thing. So remember, now remember where do I get the earth and vessel from? Coming back, right? Look, a jar filled with vinegar, an earthen jar. This is an earthen jar. That's what they had, an earthen jar filled with vinegar, filled with wine, right? That represents us, or that represents us before Yeshua, you know, it took that sin. He, he drank that cup for us, right? We were filled with that sour wine, that wine that was our sin, right? So let's um, uh, head on forward. Now, we're gonna have to take talk about vessels of dishonor because remember Tate, literally Tate is, is really a vessel that has within it a covenant, but really and truly, you know, in the context of the Aleph date, it's always in connection to Yahweh. But in general, a vessel really is, it holds a covenant. What you put in that vessel will determine whether it be a vessel of honor or dishonor, right? So it says here, to be complete, so of course, when we talk about, you know, uh, Tate, right? Remember Tate began with, you know, that word that, 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 that the symbol that means to surround, right? A vessel, right? And then of course, um, we have the yod, right? Which represents um, works, right? It represents a work, right? And of course, the ta, which represents, you know, the mark or the covenant. So therefore, the tate is, you know, something that surrounds or, you know, houses or contains, right? Good works, right? The works of the covenant, right? So, uh, so I have here, thus a tate, um, and that should be a tate right there, has a depiction of a container with the, with the mark, the cross in it, right? So oh, I think this might, I think I might have went, that must have been, right? That was a odd slide, I apologize. So that should have said vessel of dishonor. So it says here, this is the word teat. So this is a sort of reminder of the word teat, which is the root word of tate, right? Now I want you to focus on this part. We, we kind of ignore this part here about demons, right? So this is what this is really all about. Um, if in Hebrew, if something is related to something that is bad, it, it's going to have that bad meaning alongside of it. So um, obviously, you can see that um, within this root word of Tate, that you easily could be um, something that, it, well, is inhabited by something good, like the Ruach HaKadosh, or something bad, like a demon. And so this is just a this is just a scripture where you can find that word um, teat if you're interested. That's Eob or Job chapter forty one and verse thirty, right? That's just for you to find that. But look at this: is this is Matthew um, chapter twelve forty three to forty five? When the unclean rock or spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then. He says, I will return into my house from where I came out. And when he is come, he finds it empty and swept and garnished. Then goes he and takes with him seven other rockles, more as spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so, shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So as I said, right, you can be a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. If we don't become a vessel of the Ruach HaKadosh through obedience to Yahweh's Torah, we will become a habitation for evil Ruach HaKadosh, for evil spirits. We will become a vessel of dishonor. So you only have a choice. You have one choice, whether you're going to, you know, be of Yahweh or be to, you know, the, the kingdom of evil. It's, it's just one, you don't have a middle ground. You don't have your way, right? You are made to be a vessel and you will be inhabited. If you don't have Yahweh's protection, you will, you will be inhabited by his evil, uh, by, of course, um, Hasatan's, the adversary's evil 
many others. This is just a thing that will happen. In fact, you already are, right? So of course, the Tate is the ninth symbol. And so we are gonna find that there are connections to the number nine and of course, you know, Tate and the meaning of Tate. So this is taken from Matthew chapter 27. Now from the sixth hour, right? Meaning man, right? There was darkness over the land until when? The ninth hour. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? It's sixth hour to the ninth hour. Convenient, right? I mean, isn't that kind of like the theme of everything that we've covered here today? We've seen that six, right? You know, go to nine, right? Adding a three to nine, right? And Yeshua cried with a low voice saying, Eli, Eli, I'm not right? My El, my El, why have you deserted me? On hearing this, some of the bystanders said, he's calling from Eliyahu, or Eliyah, right? Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge soaked in vinegar and put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink. Then the rest said, wait, let us see if Elia comes and rescues him. But Yeshua, again, crying out in a loud voice, yielded up his ruach. So isn't that interesting that from that time to that time, what was the, what was the thing that was lost? The ruach, right? The ruach was lost. Number three right, from six to nine, right? I don't know if you guys are making this, these connections here, but, uh, you know, hopefully you'll go through it and, and you'll realize that this is all over the place, right? Now, note how Adam, man, number six, on the sixth day received the Ruach to become a vessel, and how Yeshua, on the sixth hour to the ninth hour, gave up the Ruach. So, man, Adam, received the Ruach, on the sixth day to become a vessel of honor. Um, and of course we see now a vessel of honor gives up his work for us, right? At that time period, and I think that's very interesting. So this is Mass or Acts chapter 10. Now, of course, uh, this is the, uh, this is of course the popular scripture of, you know, the, uh, this centurion, right? There was a certain man in Caesarea right? Uh, called Cornelius, a centurion, right? That, of course, is a captain of a hundred, right? Of the band called Italia, a devout man and one that feared Elohim with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to Elohim always, right? He saw in a vision, evidently, about when? The ninth hour of the day. That's not a coincidence. A Malak of Elohim coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before Elohim. And now send men to Yapa and call for Shimon, whose name is Kepha. So you're going to see uh, lots of connections with nine and the Ruach HaKadosh, the number three, right? Um, and I, I brought this up i was going to not include this but i had to include this because i want people to appreciate that as much information as you ever could get in the scriptures there are always leagues and leagues of information that you don't even touch there's no one in this walk that can actually feel confident oh i know much things right i can tell you the more you search, the more you learn, you don't know nothing yet. So this is gray sheets. This is uh, Genesis chapter one, right? The first verse of chapter one, right? Now, the yellow arrows that you see there is me counting. And I want you to appreciate every ninth symbol, right? So if you were to count, um, to the first uh, count to nine, right? You would get the Aleph here, right? If you would count nine more times, right? You would get the Sheen here. If you were to count nine more times, right? You would get the Resh here, right? And of course, the ending symbol is the Sade, which is that one on the end right here, right? So I want you to appreciate that when you put those 
three symbols together that you counted in the nines, um, by nines, I should say, you get the Hebrew word asher, ashar, right? Ashar means to be straight. You might have heard of the, the Sefer or the book of Yashar, right? Uh, it comes from this word, right? So Yashar means to be straight or Ashar means to be straight, right? It, it, it means especially to be level and look, to be right or happy, figuratively to go forward, to be honest, proper. So look at this. Happiness is connected to righteousness. Think about that. True happiness, right? So, you know, all these songs about being happy and all these things about being happy, if it's not connected to righteousness, it's not true happiness, right? True happiness is connected to being straight, level, right, to be honest, proper. So all these people who are, you know, doing all these dishonest things, they're not, they don't know happiness, those who don't have covenant with Yahweh, they don't know happiness. So do not forsake your happiness for a fleshly, you know, aberration of happiness, right? Just saying. So now let's see what I have here. So we have, okay, so that's that symbol here. So I have here the Sade. So looking at the Sade, right? Sade in Hebrew means right, to be righteous, and thus confirming the true meaning of happiness. Isn't that interesting? So Sade means to, 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 to pursue, to seek, um, and you know we're going to talk more on this, but it's connected to righteousness, right? So it's interesting how you, know, you count nine, and then we get this word ashar, which means to be happy. And then uh, we see that happiness is connected to being right, right? And that right beside it is the word, because remember, you know, to you, to, to the common eye, you know, these are letters, but they're really actually words, right? Is the word, right, connected to righteousness, right? And so, you know, it's maybe people might say, mm, Paul, that's a stretch. But, you know, I'm going to show you something. This is the blessings of, uh, from Jacob to his sons. Jacob Israel speaks his final blessings to his sons in the order of their birth. These words spoke of the things to come and the things, the, the, the hidden mysteries yet to be revealed, right? His first son, it says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of, of dignity and the excellency um, and so, and, and, and the excellency of, um, I believe it is um, my, well, I, I forgot what <laughs> the rest of it is, but um, it looks like I don't have it there. But I mean, that is the first blessing to Reuben, right? The second one and the, the, the third one, Shimon and Levi, our brethren, instruments of cruelty, are in their habitations. This is, oh, I missed the, okay, right? That's the second and third. The fourth one um, is to Yehuda. All right, thou art he who thy brethren shall praise, thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies, thy father's children shall bow. Okay, I, I see that the rest of it is below. All right, so uh, that's not, that's fine. We don't need to look at all of them. That's the fourth, that's the blessing to the fourth son, right? This is the blessing to the fifth one, right? Zebulun shall dwell in at the haven of the sea, and he shall be for a haven of ships, and his border shall be unto Zion, right? The sixth son is Yisachar. It says a strong ass crouching down between two burdens. Seventh is Don. Don shall be a serpent by the way and adder in the path that bites the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. The eighth son is God. A troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. And the ninth son is Asher. Right? The ninth son is Asher, the same Aleph, Sheen, and Resh. And his blessing is his bread shall be fat and he shall yield royal dainties. Now, Asher, if you look here, here is my little cursor. You can see Asher is that same Aleph, Sheen, and Resh that we 
counted nine you know places for to get here and it happens that he's the ninth son that's more than a coincidence see it's from this hebrew word which means happy right asher means happy um we have uh translated this incorrectly and i'm going to tell you about that after but asher is connected to happiness is connected to being right is connected to righteousness right connected to being a vessel of honor or a tate number nine right in this blessing, the bread of Asher, the happy, uh, which means happy, right? Shall be fat. This is the word shemen or oil relating to the Ruach HaKadosh. The Ruach is connected to oil, right? Because oil, it, it represents light, right? If you read the Torah, you realize there is, you need oil for the light, right? If the, the virgins run out of oil, they, they had no light. So oil is connected to light. Oil is connected to the Ruach, right? So it says here, Again, this is this word shaman is or oil relating to the Ruach of Kadesh, who is also referred to as the Ruach of Wisdom, right? Um, here in Mishle, um, or Proverbs chapter 3, 13, it says, Happy is the man, that's the word Asher, Asher, right? It's a, happy is that man that finds wisdom, and the man that gets understanding for the merchants of it is better than the merchants of silver and the gain thereof than find gold right happy right is the man that finds the rock right she is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her the length of days is in her right hand right you see them you see the word right and asher right and in her left hand are riches and honor right <laughs> her ways are of pleasantness Right, just like remember, I'm gonna go back to Asher's blessing and all her past are peace. She's a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retains her. Right? So let me go back to Asher's blessing. Asher, his bread shall be fat, and his and he shall yield royal dainties. Right? That's his blessing. And if you notice, we'll come here. We see that her ways are pleasantness, full of pleasantness, like Naomi, right? Happy is everyone that retains her. She's a tree of life. To, this, is, this is Asher's blessing, right? Men who retain, of course, the Ruach HaKadosh in walking in righteousness, right? That's the Tate, will be Ashar. They will be happy. So unless your vessel pulls within it the mark of the covenant, the Ruach HaKadosh, you can't have happiness. You cannot be a vessel of honor. And if you're not a vessel of honor, what will the potter do to you? If you refuse to be shaped in a, into a vessel of honor, well, the potter will destroy you. And that's what happens, right? So let me show you something interesting. The Sermon on the Mount, right? This is Matthew 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set um, when he was set, his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, right? So I have this here for you to notice that the word that they have translated as blessed is actually the word what? Happy or ashar, right? Right? There it is. Happy, right? So where this says, where there's no vision, the people perish, but he that keeps the Torah is what? Happy is he, right? That's, let's see if I have it here, right? That's this word, ashar. This is, this is the aleph, the sheen, and the resh. And um, that, is, that is to be, um, if you notice this dot here, um, means him. This is to say to him, right? So this is happy is him, right? Or happy is he, right? So look at this. I want you to look at the Sermon on the Mount. So every time you see blessed, it's actually happy, right? So if you look at, Chapter five, verse three, the first one says, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the Shamaim, right? Happy are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Happy are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Happy are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Happy 
are the pure in heart, for they shall see Elohim. Happy are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of Elohim. Happy are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of the Shammai and the heaven. And it says, happy are you when men revile and persecute you and shall say all men of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You mean to tell me there are nine blessings connecting to happy, connecting to Tate, connecting to being a vessel of honor? All of those things cannot, cannot be accidents. They cannot be accidents, right? So I am going to finish this off with a, a word um, with Tate. Popular one is the word Tob. I mean, we looked at Tate, right? Uh, tob is a, you know, when we say good morning, we say Boker Tob or El Tob, which is, you know, good evening, right? Or Tob Meod, very good, right? Tob is the word that we use to translate for good. And I have all these things here. A good in the wider sense, um, good as being a good person, a good, a good man, good woman, right? That's what the word tob means. And for you to be a good person or for something to be good, goodness is actually surrounded by the home. So, so here is the word in Hebrew, tob. So of course the tate is up top, which of course is a vessel, um, earthen vessel, to surround, and of course, the wow, which is the number six, represents man, right? And then the bait, which is the house, right? So, so if you combine all those things, what, what it means to be tob is goodness comes when surrounding that connection, right, to the house, right? Or that connection or the man to the house, right? So really and truly, when we, when we, for us to be good, right, we have to surround, we have to, we have to, you know, have Yahweh in our midst. We have to have Yahweh in our midst. We have to be connected, you know, through our mediator. If we're not, if we don't surround our mediator, and if we're not connected to the host, and the host, by the way, is referenced, is referenced to Yahweh's host. And by the way, in the context, in the context of like a family, right? If you have a family member, if you have somebody in, if you have the head of the host, and people are not connected to the head of the house, right? That's not good. Everything goes, everything goes downhill. Everything becomes evil once it is that the headship, that the man of the house is usurped, right? And similar for us, when we usurp our, or we go outside of the connection, right, that we have to the house, it goes, it is evil, right? So if you go outside of the Torah, Right. If you go outside of Yahweh's word, if you go outside of the Torah of the man of the house, it is evil. Right. It is. It is. It is not told. Right. So um, that was a lot. Here's a conclusion. Right. And I think uh, um, the Hebrew letter Tate represents the part of our journey after we have separated ourselves and become set apart to be cleansed and prepared for good works. And that's, that is the end, right? Oops, ah, there's my Toda. All right, thank you, thank you very much. So now let us open up for some questions. Let's hear what you guys have to share. Did you get everybody get everything? That was a lot. Oh my, that's how long I kept you. Oh my, I apologize. Uh, hopefully, you guys are still online. Good evening. I have a question. Yeah, okay, awesome. Could you relate? Could you relate what you have said so far to? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm not hearing you. Um, could you repeat one more time? Are you hearing me any better now? Yes, I'm hearing you better now, yes. Okay, I am asking about Mark 2, verse 22. Um, Mark, Mark no 2, one, verse right. All right. No one puts new wine into old wine skins. Like, um, right, <laughs> precisely, absolutely. 
Uh, so you want me to really, so of course, um, the wine skin, of course, uh, is a vessel. And the whole idea of the Tate is that it is a vessel. Um, now, remember, if you, even, even biologically, right? Um, skin is, is really dust, right? So flesh, any flesh is really just dust. So really um, a wine skin or any, any, kind of, any kind of skin vessel is still, is still actually accounted as dirt, right? Um, so it's the, the wine skin is, is the tate. And, uh, you know, in, in, re in relation to everything that we've seen here, you recognize that, you know, just like what we saw in the crucifixion, right? We had this sour wine, we had this bad blood, we had this corrupted spirit that dwelled or inhabited, you know, into our bodies. And, you know, when we accepted Yeshua, right, we received his new spirit, right? Now, what happens is, uh, that's why, that's why this, that's why this vessel has to be destroyed. This vessel has to be destroyed, right? So that, you know, um, to, uh, for that new spirit to inhabit. In fact, if you record, if you look at that scripture from, was it Mark? Sorry, Mark 3? Mark 2. Mark 2. Thank you. Mark 2. Let's go there. Mark 2. And verse where? It's a conversation that starts from about verse 18, but the statement is in verse 22. 18. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. Right. So it says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth or an old garment or else the patch shrinks and, new, and the new tears away from the old um, and a worse hole is made. No one puts new wine into old wine skins or what happens? It says the new wine will burst the skins and the, old, and the wine pours out and the skins will be destroyed and they will put new wine into fresh wine skins. So I want you to recognize that when he comes, what's he going to do? He's going to destroy the flesh, right? In the twinkling of an eye, right? He, this flesh, this body is going to be destroyed. And, and likewise, I want you to recognize that the Ruach HaKadosh that is inside of us, you know what it's doing? It's destroying our flesh, just like what this is talking about. That's why it says we die daily. It's talking about, you know, the flesh, the man being destroyed by the, Ru the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit, right? So, you know, I, I wanted to, to appreciate that you know, um, when we you know when you look at Galatians chapter five, right, and it talks about the fact that you know the the flesh and the the rock, the spirit are at enmity; they are at war with each other, right? It means that as you grow spiritually, what's going to happen? Your flesh is going to be destroyed. That's what's going to happen, right? And so that, that is that's really and truly the same kind of context. Um, this vessel is being destroyed by, you know, the, the Rock of Kadesh and the um, desires of it, right? So, um, yeah, that's, 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 the, that's the connection I have there. Okay, thank you. I have one more question. No um, you had mentioned something about there being a similarity between Moses turning water into blood and right. Yeshua turning water into wine. Um, and then I recall that in Deuteronomy 18, 15, Moses had said that a prophet like him would rise up. So is, can we make that kind of relation? There? Absolutely. In fact, I, it's funny. Um, in fact, I was expecting another person to um, probably talk about it. But, you know, uh, that prophecy, I want you to appreciate that um, if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, right? It will tell you, sorry, I apologize, chapter 33, right? It will tell you that there is no other prophet like Moshe that does signs and wonders like unto him, right? At that time, right? So for you to be a prophet like Moshe, you have to do the signs and wonders like him. There's no other prophet ever that actually transforms water, right? And I want, if, you, if you recall, um, I don't, I don't know if, we, if, if, if we've gone there before, but I wanted to recall that, or for you to know that water in its representation is uncontrollable. 
So the only, only one that can control water is Elohim, is Yahweh himself, right? So, so really and truly, you know, um, we see that, you know, that kind of work is something set apart and, you know, something that really and truly the only persons that can do these things are, are those who have the name or the title of mediator. Only a mediator of Yahweh, right, can do Yahweh's work, right? That person is set apart in their works. And that's why Yeshua said that you should, you should believe me for my work's sake, right? These works that I'm doing, they're not like the rest of the prophets, right? These works that I'm doing is like Moshe. That's why you should believe in me. Because Moshe wrote about me. I'm just like Moshe, right? So, so this, this, whole, this whole idea of, you know, like the, the whole conversion of water into wine blood, right? That's, that sh- a person should have seen that miracle. And you notice it's the, it's the first miracle. It's the first miracle. It's the first, sorry, I apologize. According to, this, according to the scriptures, it's the first of his signs, right? Which, of course, is very significant. It's not like an arbitrary sign. A person seeing that, right, they should know that this is the one that the, the scripture spoke about, right? It couldn't have been Joshua, or Yahushua. It couldn't have been nobody else, right? But, of course, Yeshua. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, thank you for that question. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right. Anyone else? Wow, buddy. Yes, um, good night again, Paul. Oh, oh. Right, so I'm just thinking about the ninth commandment. Oh. If it has any any relation to the ninth letter. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, in in regards to destroying in destroying the okay. So if you recall. Um, one of the th- one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that um, one of the most um, abominable things is for you to destroy um, Yahweh's image, right? Yahweh's image is you know um, the the prevalent thing um, in 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 all of Torah, right? So when you look at the you know the ten the ten words. Right, you'll notice that they're kind of divided up, right? So uh, going to the first five, right? Those are are, are directly, uh, as I said to you before, connected to you know um, Yahweh's um, image as, uh, and of course, loving Yahweh versus you know loving your neighbor. So it kind of represents those two you know, um, great commandment, the first great commandment, and of course, you know, the second great commandment. Now, um, as I said to you, when we look in the scriptures and it talks about love, it says, if you can't love your brother, right, who is made in Yahweh's image, right, you can't, you can't, you don't love Yahweh, right, because he's made in, in his image. So if you look at the ninth the ninth one, right, right, which of course, right, is about giving false testimony. Um, you know, I would have to say, uh, yeah, that that actually has to deal with you know um, uh, destroying the. Oh my word, where's where's my words? <laughs> I lost my words. So okay, so in. Uh, in the scriptures, you see that word for false testimony. It's from this word called sheker, right? Now, sheker in Hebrew, falsehood, it comes from an aberration of truth. The, I don't know if I should explain this from this part, but I'm just gonna go, I'll go ahead anyways. So the word for truth, right? If you were to look at it in Hebrew, it literally, the words, or the letter, I should say, the symbols for it are in order, right? So it starts with the first symbol, which is the Aleph, and the middle symbol, which is the name, and the last one, which is the Ta. And so you understand that, you know, something that is in truth is actually 
you know, an understanding of the beginning, the middle, and the last, right? And also it has to do with order, right? Now, I apologize for they're having a party out there. Um, so when we talk about sheker, which is the word for falsehood, that word for falsehood is actually, it begins with um, the, the, the second to last, you know, symbol, the, the whole word, it's actually spelled out of order, right? To show you the kind of whole thing about chaos. When it is that you give a false testimony against your neighbor, and you, you, you're literally actually defiling the image of Yahweh, right? Um, because remember, he is the way, the truth, and the life, right? Every time that you bear false testimony, you actually um, take into yourself, or you bear onto yourself, or you bear within yourself an evil. Um, so uh, what I... I should actually have brought up was Leviticus. If you look at Leviticus chapter 19 and from verse, oh my word, I did the wrong thing. I apologize. I typed it in the wrong place. Uh, watch this. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 15. Watch this. From verse 15, it says here, Look at verse 16. You shall not go around as a slanderer, right? Among your people, right? That is, you know, to bear false witness. You are a slanderer if you do so. You shall not engage, sorry, endanger the life of your neighbor. I am Yahweh. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. So you see this, there's this whole idea of whenever you do this, what are you doing? You are, you're defiling this vessel, right? You're, def you're filling your vessel with that sour wine, that corrupt wine, as you know, we, we may mention in the previous, previous sections, right? So I would have to say that when you look at um, the Torah, anything concerning your brother is a very serious offense. And that is why you notice that if you're going to go to the temple, right? Because when you go to the temple and you give an offering, your gift is not what is in your hand, you know. Your gift is what is inside of you, right? That is why you see the scripture says that you should be, you know, it's, it's just, you should be a cheerful giver, right? It's because what you give is not in your hand. And you can think of this like the widow's might, right? Uh, she, was, she gave more than everyone, because what she gave was from the inside. So what determines whether you are a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor comes from your inside. And if it is that you are against your brother, right? You are, you are a vessel of dishonor, right? And of course, likewise, likewise, if you are to love your brother, you become a, a vessel of, of, of honor. So, um, I mean, that's, the, that's pretty much I mean, the only thing that, that, that comes to my mind, um, the main thing that I recognize is, like many things, um, I've seen more scriptures about bearing sin in regarding to your neighbor, right, than, than anything else. And this idea of bearing sin is basically you being filled with iniquity, you being filled with unrighteousness, which is why... If you notice, they, they call the Pharisees uh, a brood of vipers filled with venom. You know why? They hated, they hated their neighbor. They hate their own brothers, right? They, they chose murderers over, over the people who love them. So, you know, I guess, you know, all of these things um, is, is interesting to me because they make their outside to be so pure and holy, Right? You know, they lengthen their zitzit, you know, they, they, they sit in chief places, right? On the outside, they look like a, a vista of honor, but because of that one commandment from which they pretty much, if you notice, uh, they pretty much defile um, everybody around them. In fact, the scripture says they make, you know, their, uh, the people who they disciple like more abominable 
They make them more abominable than themselves, right? They, 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 they literally really are um, the embodiment of, uh, I would have to say, um, well, I have to tell you that we have to be honest and say that a lot of times uh, we, we are similar to the Pharisees ourselves. And so, you know, that is why we, <laughs> we have to be very careful of when we say things. However, we acknowledge that, you know, when we find out that there's something wrong, that we repent of it because it is very, very easy, very, very easy, right, to go against your brother or say something against your brother, um, to bear false testimony against your brother. Um, false testimony, by the way, is not just you saying something that you know is wrong. False testimony also lines up with saying something um, that you have no way of knowing. Like, for example, if I say you will never amount to anything or you will never be able to do this or do that, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not in Yahweh's hand or to say that you are going to die tomorrow. Um, I'm not in Yahweh's place to say those things. Those are false testimonies, right? Uh, so false testimony is a very large spread thing, a very widespread thing. And, you know, it is equivalent, again, to murdering your brother. So I don't know if I'm uh, really and truly, it's, um, it's something that we probably could spend some more time and, and look at it. Um, some more to see what else is there, but I'm pretty sure there's, you know, a vast amount of things connected there. Um, you know, I, I, you see all of those things that I, I, I brought up in the presentation, I can tell you, um, as I was going through the presentation, more and more things came up uh, and more things that couldn't really go into that presentation. I, I recognized that the presentation was a hundred slides and I realized, huh, I need to stop. But, um, you know, it's, it's just very interesting that, you know, patterns, they're very consistent. And then you're going to find evidences that these things are not accidents. Every single, every single symbol in the order that it is in, right? Every single number, every single, every single thing that Yeshua said, all of these things are connected. It's not an accident that you had nine blessings or nine, you know, um, phrases from the Sermon on the Mount concerning happy. It's not, it's not a coincidence that the ninth son is named happy, you know, or, you know, um, Asher. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not an accident that all these things are connected to number nine because, you know what, um, number nine is essentially, you know, um, recognizing that a person who is whole is one who has the Ruach HaKadosh, who does honorable things with or good works with that vessel as a fruit of what is in that vessel, right? So how do you know somebody is a true believer? How do you know? You know them by their, their works, by, by the fruit that comes out of them, right? So, so therefore, you know, um, what does the scripture says? If somebody doesn't love their neighbor, then there's no love in them. There's no covenant in them. So, you know, um, hopefully, hopefully, you know, you get something out of that. If not, I, I can, as I said to you, there are so many dimensions to this. I'm sure some, some of you right now probably have something on your mind. Um, there are so many things in scriptures connected to number nine and not, num not nine directly. You just kind of have to fit the puzzles in um, together, right? So I don't know, hopefully get something out of that. Is there any questions? Any more questions? Oh, did my thing freeze? Oh no, what happened? I don't think I can. All right, that seems to be it for tonight. Oh, okay. Oh, 
Okay. Is that is is that it? Okay. Hmm. Um. Well, I just have one brief thing. I have one brief thing to share. Um. But um, I am not going to make it long since I've kept you long enough. I I actually um. Well, what I will do is that I will I'll just make mention of it here, and then I'll I'll probably try to find some time in the next one to bring it up. But um, last presentation, there was a slide um, concerning um, concerning the the whole um, uh, resurrection thing, where of course Yeshua um, rose, you know, and you know the on first fruits, of course. Right, which of course would have been after Shabbat, right? I, I made mention of the the Talmudim or the disciples, you know, gathering. However, I misrepresented really um, the reason why they gathered on the eighth day. Um, so, just a very brief understanding because I because I realized I went too fast and and I missed a whole lot of things. So uh, I'm gonna make I'm gonna just give you a brief. Um, brief, very, very brief um, covering on that. So I did make mention that, you know, um, having, you know, resurrected and everything, um, that he would have had to go through um, some cleansing or purification, um, which would have started from that day. Um, so, the, but in essence, the uh, reason for the eight days has nothing to do particularly with his cleansing, um, it had nothing to do with that. It actually really actually had to do with um, the fact that um, for all of them to be gathered again, um, remember they visited his grave. So it, it is had to do with him, uh, with them um, and not him. So I went too fast on that, um, but um, very brief. Oh, so very, so, but very briefly though, um, uh, there were some questions I didn't address, like, for example, um, scriptures that talk about, you know, the resurrection body being incorruptible, right? Um, uh, if you do, you know, a brief checkup on that word incorruptible, it, it means that it's immortal. Uh, it means that it doesn't die. It's, it's not that it can't be, like, corrupted. <laughs> it means it, it just can't die. Um, but... Why, why I made mention of the uh, thing that I made mention in terms of the water of separation that is, of course, sprayed up, uh, put upon a dead person is because uh, Yeshua's, you know, um, that, that pattern has to be mainly because of the fulfillment of the, uh, of the Moedi. So we know he died on Passover and he rose on first fruits. First fruits happens in a feast, a, a set of feast days. Well, in a feast day, known as, of course, unleavened bread, right? Unleavened bread is if you read Exodus 12 or you know any Leviticus chapter 23, it's about it's about the purging of leaven, right? It's about purification. That's what unleavened bread is about. And so that's why you notice that there kind of has to be seven days of purification, right? Um, so, um, so for, for here where it is my, my error, um, whenever it is that you look at anything in, part, in the Gospels, right? And, and, and I think just in general, you should find two or three witnesses, but particularly when you look at things in the Gospels, uh, you can't really look at one you, or two. You kind of have to look at all four and understand that each each individual gospel, you know, has um, something that is kind of missing from the other. Um, for you to understand the event, you kind of have to look at all of them. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put together something kind of very um, a, a correction really for that um, in the next one. So um, yeah, so that's that's that is it. So if um, yeah, so that's 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 for next week. Oh, sorry, I apologize. Um, the week after next week. All right. So, as always, thank you, sir, for your presentation. It is much appreciated and much was learned, much to reflect on.
and to digest thanks also for everyone joining us i know that our schedule can become a bit busy and it's hard to stay awake in the evenings especially for myself but i know that yahweh is pleased every time we carve out times time for from our busy day and our busy schedule and allot it to his work and to our spiritual development so kudos to everyone who participated and thanks again to our presenter and greatest of all thanks to the creator for affording us such a privilege to join in such manner and to dissect his word and to learn more about him shalom everyone Hello. Hello.